How do American high schools compare with high schools in the Sudan? In the Sudan we study. In the Sudan we get more knowledge of the subject that we study, more than the American students do. And how about the United Kingdom? I must say that the American high school is not nearly as bad as I've been led to expect. <laughs> how do they compare with Norwegian schools? I think that the American high school student's freedom of choice narrows his outlook. And how about Korea? In Korea, we study much harder than the American students do. We take 18 subjects a year instead of just five. We go to school on Saturday. A television presentation of the New York Herald Tribune Forum for High Schools. It features teenagers from practically everywhere in unrehearsed discussion of a few of their common problems. Each of these young people, 34 in all from 34 countries, each was chosen in a nationwide forum competition held under the auspices of the Ministries of Education in their own countries. They were brought to the United States by Pan American World Airways and Transworld Airlines and are spending three months in this country. During this time, they'll be guests in four different American host families and school communities. They've been going to school all day, every day, since they arrived in this country, and tonight they ought to be experts in a way on our subject, American high schools, how do they compare with high schools in other countries? But let me first introduce you to the four participants. First, from the Sudan, is Bashir Abdel Gader. From Norway, Anne Leira. And I got a letter from your faculty advisor today who says that in eight lessons, you've learned a typewriter. Is that true? Well, I tried to learn in a way. Did you type that paper you sent me? Yes, I did. Perfectly amazing. The teacher said it was really unbelievable. Congratulations to you. From the United Kingdom, here is John Tarode. John, Hi. Uh, what's going on in your life? Well, I'm learning, I think, to tolerate, to tolerate, to tolerate. I, my views were narrow, I think, when I came over here, especially in regards to the United States. And uh, Sang Mi Cher from Korea. Sang Mi, uh, what's interested you lately? Well, I think that is uh, boys and girls dance together, cheek <laughs> to cheek. It's so funny that I couldn't have flapping all like the it? time. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm sorry, I question censored. I should say one thing to you, Sang Mi. I had a letter from your faculty advisor today. Uh, you know what she said to me about you? No. I wonder if it's fair to read. She said she is so full of the joy of just being alive that it's a pleasure to be with her. Yeah. Well, education. How do American high schools compare with high schools in other countries? Uh, how do we start this one off? Well, I think Anne made a rather surprising remark when she said that the American freedom of choice narrows the outlook of the student. Surely the opposite would be true. Why isn't their outlook broadened by this freedom? Because he, I think he most often will choose the subjects uh, where he is at ease, subjects mm -hmm. that interest him. And um, instead, of, instead of thinking of what might be good for him. Mm -hmm. Well, I tend to agree with you because we are expected to have a, a certain background in every subject before we begin to specialize. We aren't allowed to choose at an early age. And I think that is good because until we have had several years hard work at almost every subject, we can have no real idea what is of value for us. That's right. That's what, what mm -hmm. I tried to say. But I'd like Sorry. to ask you a question. And will you talk a little bit closer to the microphone? <laughs> you said that the, the American high schools were not nearly as bad as you had expected them to be. But I've been defending your points of view since your first for <laughs> a television appearance. Well, I'm glad to find to start with that somebody is defending any of my views. But as for the British impression of the American high school, I'm afraid we regard it as something between the blackboard jungle and a luxury holiday camp. Now, of course, this just isn't true. We may have find many things to criticize in the American high school, but the impression it gives abroad is even worse than the truth. For example, in England, we have a much more formal discipline in school. I think that's good, not so much because of the discipline. There's no particular value in calling a master sir, in standing up when he enters the room, in wearing school uniform, but it does provide a more formal background and a more studious atmosphere inside the school. The uniform is, I think, important. Americans don't like it, do they, very much? They no, I wonder what the rest of you feel about that. Vashi? I think that uh, the school uniform is the way that we can show order. And by having a school uniform, all the students having the same uniform, it is a way of expressing order, and they like this idea. Unfortunately, I did not, I did not find this idea, uh, this uh, 
were in the American schools, and I did not approve it very much. Save me, how about you? Well, our Korean high school students always wear school emblems on their school uniforms. And I think it is very nice uh, to see the uh, older students in the same uniforms. And are they really proud of, they really are proud of them. Uh, I think it is very convenient and practical to wear uniforms uh, because we don't have to uh, spend a great sum of money for buying any uh, clothing. Uh, uh, we usually have, uh, uh, yes, instead of spending the money for buying the clothing, we spend the money for buying our books and we have uh, plenty of reference books and famous novels and all kinds of vo books which we uh, read uh, uh, for leisure in, in our spare time. Are, are you, all of you, and do you agree? Are uniforms a good no, idea? No, excuse me, I must... Uh, I don't think quite agree with the three of you. I think that uniforms may make you look like an army camp. I would object to have school uniforms in my country. Instead of uniforms, we were pinafores with scrabblings on them and often our initials upon yeah. them, all kinds of funny things. But uh, I would never, never wear a uniform. Wouldn't you think it would be a better solution with, well, like a pinafore over your ordinary daily clothing? Well, possibly, but we say it's more democratic to wear a uniform. That, I think, is very un-American, isn't it? Because we feel that it cuts right across financial barriers, class barriers, and ensures that there are no rich girls who wear a different dress each day and poor children who feel out of it. It makes for one class inside the school. Well, that is your main point, then, on uniforms. You say it's more democratic. You say, Bashir, it gives more order. a sense of order. Yes. And you say that it doesn't cost so much and you can spend your money on books. Well, now, uh, to move on a minute from uniforms, um, how are you reacting to co-education here? I think co-education is good as far as we consider the so social life of the students. I do like the idea of seeing boys and girls together in one class and in the uh, veranda of the, of the school, and I like it very much. But if I think uh, a bit uh, of the distraction that comes out of this co-education, <laughs> I will not like the idea. <laughs> I like co-education. I've always had co-education, and I, I simply cannot think uh, of going to an all-girls school. I would, think, I would feel... You don't feel any distraction about it. <laughs> no, I'm used to having the boys next door and in my class and everywhere, so I, I think I would feel lost without them. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say, Sagan? Well, I myself prefer the uh, co-educational system uh, to the separate system, but in Korea we have not been proving of the co-educational system. So, uh, oh, I thought you had it in grade school. Oh, uh, yes. And in college, too, don't you? Oh, uh, yes, that's co-educational. And well, in elementary school, too. It's just in high school that you don't just have it. Just in high school. Oh, that seems peculiar. <laughs> we have the same thing, Ms. Laura. We have it in college, and we have it in some of the elementary schools. But we don't have it in uh, the high schools. And I, I agree to this idea of not having co-education in this particular states, the high school. But surely we live in one world. I mean, in my own country, we have both co-educational schools and schools which are not co-educational. We always find that the children who've been to co-educational schools are far better balanced children and are able to behave far more naturally at the age of perhaps 17, 18 or 19, which is the most difficult period for a child. I agree with John. Can I get you on to some of the more basic things relating directly to education? You made some fairly challenging statements in the beginning here. Um, John, I want to know what you meant, really. And I haven't had from Anne, although she tried to get a satisfactory answer. What did you mean that Americans weren't quite as bad as you thought they were? In what ways? Well, I thought that they did even less work and had even less discipline than they have. But I still feel that there is too little discipline and too little hard work in the American high school. Now, I don't say that entirely I disapprove of this. I would have been very happy to have been at a school of this nature myself. It strikes me as a wonderful life. But it's a very expensive luxury, I think, for the American nation, this high school education. We in Britain, for example, segregate at the age of 11 approximately 20% of our top pupils from each year. They go to a special school which is, would be roughly equivalent to a college prep school over here. They are working all the time for a university course. They realize the seriousness of their study 
and they're not distracted by the many children who go to school merely because the law of the land says that they shall be there. Saying me, tell us a little bit more about the Koreans. I was horrified when you said you take 18 subjects a week. How can you? Uh, well, they are the uh, Korean, first of all, and English, and either German or French. We can uh, choose one of them. And uh, we study uh, mathematics, including uh, algebra, geometry, trigonometry, and we study calculus, too, in high, in high school. And we study history and geometry, and we study civics, well, and so forth and so and on. Sciences, 18 <laughs> subjects a year. Yes. Well, now, how can you learn anything about 18 subjects? I should think that four, or at most five, would be the limit. Well, uh, we study different subjects every day. Was that a good idea? Yes, so. we have yeah. in Sudan, I think. We have in Sudan, but we haven't 18 subjects. We have about 12 subjects a year. And uh, every day we study s different subjects. Well, I'd like to hear a defense of why this is a good idea. It seems strange to me. Well, shall I take it? If you will. Well, um, <laughs> but what we believe is that by having a large number of subjects going at one time, instead of taking subjects for one year and then dropping them, we are developing the education right. right the way up. In America, I found a lot of children say, oh, well, we have to take, what is it, one year's chemistry and so many years of this to get into college, and therefore we take it, forget about it, we get our credit marks, and it's gone. But in England, if you're developing the, say, the, all your subjects up, straight the way up, you are holding on to them, and you're holding your education together as one single entity. That's right. That's quite true in Korea. In my and, uh, country. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Go ahead, Anne. In my country, we have a fixed curriculum set up by the Ministry of Education for all high schools. So all students study the same things and have to take the same final tests. I think it gives us a broader background to take some subjects we don't want to take. I think it has done me personally good to take, for example, mathematics. I'm uh, majoring in languages, but all the same, I have to have four years of math. And that's quite advanced math sometimes, too, compared to what I've seen. Well, why wasn't it a waste of time if you're going into languages and not science? Well, I think it's, a, it's good for me personally to have some idea of what mathematics is. But if I didn't have had those four years, I, I would have felt as if I was some kind of uh, uneducated. <laughs> might, might I say that? <laughs> yeah, that's all right. You get some arguments from American students by saying that you ought to take the hardest possible things, even you like it or not, just for the mental discipline of it. Have you had this kind of argument with any American students? Well, I found that a very large number of the more able students agree with me that they are being held back by their educational system, that they are not able to advance as rapidly as they would like to, and they're sorry for it. Really? Uh, yes, yeah, some oh, of yeah. them, I point out. Yes, there, are many, so. there are many of them who are very glad about it, I think. Yes, I have found lots of American students who are c quite complete complaining of the educational system in America. And, and they then... found the same thing. They're complaining that this system is just a sort of killing intellectual curiosity in the students. And uh, those who are gifted are not given the special look. And they are just regarded as other common people, I mean, uh, the ordinary students. And this is not a very good way of uh, having more intellectual people. Tell me more about that. We're really concerned in this country right now with whether we're doing enough for the gifted. Tell me specifically about the schools you've been in. Who are these people you've been talking to that are complaining? Of course, it's mostly our host students, but also we've had discussions in class, and when I tell them about all the subjects we have to take, about 12 subjects a year, they are very astonished, and I think some of them would like to have, to really like to have had more to do, more subjects to take. They don't have the possibility to take the subjects they want. They cannot take more than six subjects top a year. Mm -hmm. So th that restricts them. The system, it's not that the students uh, don't have the brains, because many of them have very good brains. But well, whose fault is it then, if it isn't the students' fault? It must I be the system. American. I agree. Uh. Well, go on. Tell me more about that, Sagan. Well, I think the fault of, uh, that's the fault of uh, the educational system in America, and at the same time, the educators in America. Well, I, I wouldn't blame the educators so strongly myself. For example, I was talking to some teachers about homogeneous grouping, do you call it, over here? And they said that it would just not work out in effect because in various large communities where it had been tried, the local big shots wished to see their own children in the A stream. Now, this, I think, is one of the harmful 
results of having your community so closely controlling your high school. In England, we try and get the control at no closer level than the county, which is more or less equivalent to the state. And in this way, we have the popular control of our educational system, but not so closely that it will reflect all the minor prejudices, misconceptions and pressures of the, of the community itself. You're getting right at the heart of the philosophy of American education here. Uh, how do you defend your system when Americans say that the only way to keep schools free is to have local control and that we wouldn't for anything let the national government control schools? I think I would uh, suggest to, uh, to separate the schools. In my country, a high school is a school that uh, basically deals with academical subjects. Mm -hmm. We have secondary schools for vocational training. And I think it's better for, for both kinds of students, those who are ex especially interested in academical subjects as well as for those who want uh, a more technical or vocational training, to be separated on an earlier level. Have you tried that argument on Americans? I have, and many of them agree with me, especially the students. Now, what surprised me is that many Americans have said that it's undemocratic to divide children up according to ability but it strikes me as being essentially undemocratic to attempt to hold children of ability back, or at least, if not consciously, to attempt to hold them back, at least make it difficult for them to progress. I mean, this is, to me, is a very negation of democratic education. I agree with John. I agree with you very much. They said that it is a democratic thing to keep all the students, who, those who are gifted and those who are ordinary in the same way, and not to treat them especially. I can't see it from the American classes. I cannot guess who is, who is the gifted boy. But even in my, in my class in the Sudan, I can see from the behavior of the teacher who is the best boy in the class. Here in America, I can't see it, and I can't see who is good and who is bad. And I think it is not a democratic way of just killing this, as I said, intellectual curiosity of the students. I think it is better to make the inter intellectual curiosity of the students exist in their minds so that they can work harder. Would you then say that it's the fault of the teacher that the uh, American high school students uh, don't have, well, that they don't, uh, are not so advanced as in I think country. the fault is not the fault of teachers only. It may be fault of the system, the fault of the teacher, and the, the fault of the system and the teacher together, I think. Well, te and nothing of the student. Hmm. Oh, yes, this. John, what do you want to say? Well, I was going to say many of the teachers I've spoken to are aware of these shortcomings and they're trying hard to reform them. I think, though, the opposition is coming to a great extent from the elected school boards and, as I said, the local communities who have the school so closely under their thumbs. They're the people who, I'm afraid, will never give in, the people who can rule from ignorance because no argument is going to convince such people. John, did you really talk to people who had tried this grouping and whose communities had forced them to abandon it? Not had forced them to abandon it, but they said that there was so much pressure from people with local influence as to why their own children were not in the, hi the highest groups, that it would just became a farce attempting to run it and that people had to gradually drop out of the homogeneous grouping again. But how do your countries work? Isn't th is there no pressure from parents when a student gets a higher grade on an exam and therefore goes into uh, another kind of school? Oh yes, we have this pressure, but by running our schools from the county level essentially, we ensure that uh, a complaint will be filtered up and it will filter back again and that people's tempers will be cooled down and that local pressure directly just doesn't exist at all. Now let me shift gears here just a moment. You've, if I've understood you up to now, you've been saying that the American students don't use their intellectual curiosity as much as they could, they don't use their brains as much as they could and they would actually like to be using them a little bit more. You're saying mm -hmm. that your education up to now has been better than the Americans, right? I think so. All right, now you he you're here in a foreign country. You've got good minds, granted. Nobody with a good mind can come to a foreign country and not get some new ideas or begin at least to think in new ruts. Tell me what's been happening to you up here since you've been here. Anything interesting at all going on? Any new ideas? Yes. Of course, I was observing the life around me, and I can see from the behavior of the people what sort of people they are. I have been uh, impressed by many of the things that I've seen in America. For example, they said to me in my country, there is no such segregation or things like that in the Northern America. In the Northern? Yes, in the North. But now I can find it. I can feel it from the behavior of the people that there is something in the heart of the people towards each other. And there is some sort of segregation between the people. And this is one of the impressions that they have. 
Is it something you feel only, Bashir? Oh, I can see it from the behavior of the people. For example, in the school, I see the students. The colored students are staying alone and the white students are staying alone. In the town, they, they once asked me if I want to go to the colored section. And I was shocked by that. And I can see it in the street, I can see in the uh, restaurants, in the shops, I can see people mixing together. And they regard the person by his color, and this is the thing that... Uh, well, you must be quite a remarkable bridge in the communities you've been in, if you say... <laughs> no, I mean, it's not a severe... Of course, I have seen people, colored people, speaking to white people and behave because life wants, wants them to be so. And they have been discussing this problem of many with, them, uh, uh, with many of these uh, people. And the answer they gave me is that this is the way that it used to be, and that we are waiting for time to solve it. Mm -hmm. You're staying in a white family, aren't you? Yes. Well, that is already a contradiction of, of uh, what you're saying, is it not? Why? <laughs> <laughs> and what about you? Has your mind been working? Forgive me, but I want to give Anne a chance. Has your mind been working any since you've been here? On what? Well, I hope so. It ought to, because I have had the most wonderful chances to do some brain work. I've had uh, many discussions with my host students, with my families, and of course in school. And my points of view have been changing. Well, can you be a little specific? We'd like to know and share, if we aren't being too personal. Well, I think that uh, my impression or uh, preconception of American teenagers was not as it ought to have been. I was very much impressed by the friendliness everybody showed towards me in my host schools. And, well, I, I think I also had, hadn't quite uh, got the right idea of their standards in school. I think I had uh, devaluated them. I found that they were better than what I had supposed them to be. And very many of my other ideas have been changing too. You're just tantalizing when you say things like that and don't let us know what. Let's go on to John. Maybe we can come back to you. You've been, uh, what's been going on with you upstairs, Jay? Well, I, <laughs> I think I've learned some very salutary lessons about the United States. You see, in England, in Europe generally, we regard America with a certain sort of tolerance and patronage I mean, it's most unfair of us, I know, but, I mean, as you probably realize yourself, an American journalist, an American lecturer, anybody coming to Britain or to Europe has to fight against the fact that we regard every American as automatically a rock and roll fiend, as somebody who, anybody who's been to an American college, well, he's far inferior to a British college. After all, look at all the American colleges. They couldn't be as good. I'm just beginning to realize that the American, the educated and intelligent American is far better informed, I would say, than the average European, and that they are far more intelligent and far more live, I feel. Now, how do you explain that, John? It's a difficult question. Maybe you're a new country, and that those who sort of fought through... Well, they couldn't have got that in school. I don't they? think they could have done. I think possibly your colleges do a very good job, your better colleges. For example, when we meet students, on exchange scholarships, especially postgraduate students in Great Britain, we are always impressed by the high standards which they maintain. Saying me, I want to give you a chance here. What have you been thinking about? Have the wheels uh, been going round? Well, one of the most significant thing I've found here is that uh, we are, in the long run, the same people yeah. all over the world. Even though we are, in, uh, we are living in different parts of the world with a different way of living. And so uh, we should understand each other, and we should help and love each other. But didn't you know that we were all basically the same, all human beings the same, before you came, Sangri? Well, I thought that uh, the Americans were different from Koreans. <laughs> Why yeah. did you? Because they are different people. They are living in the different countries. No, but you'd seen lots of Americans in Korea, hadn't you? Yes. <laughs> are you willing to say any more about that? Well... No, you aren't. <laughs> but then, of course, one never sees the best side of America from an army of occupation or even from troops who are stationed in the country as friends, does one? And I mean, I think that has been one of the disasters which had befallen Europe, tr attempting to judge America from the troops stationed there. I mean, no troops are a very good advertisement for their country. Troops and tourists, I suppose. Yes, troops and tourists. Uh, John, to summarize now and come back to the beginning, have you gotten a sufficient answer from Anne on her point that American students' freedom limits them? Well, I don't know. Would you like to say any more about that, Anne? I, I still wonder. Do you think that, in effect, they're not using their freedom correctly? Is that what you're saying? Uh, I would say that freedom, 
when the responsibility mm. with having such a freedom is not stressed. Oh, but as students, are Americans as free as you are or freer? Or not as free? I would say that in my school, I have a greater personal freedom than the American students have here. But it's always very close connected with responsibility. And I know, and every student in my school knows, that if he doesn't use his freedom as he, he should use it, then he, he won't have it. It's the responsibility on the same time. We have to judge freedom, responsibility. We have to behave uh, well according to, to what the freedom claims from us. Then on that subject, you would throw just a little bit of the challenge to the American student. You say freedom has to go with responsibility. I think so. So in blaming the system and in blaming the teacher, you would throw just a little blame on the individual, would you? I'm sorry, our time is just about up, but I want to give you each a chance to say the thing that you've most got on your mind in summary of these few weeks now that you've been here in American high schools. Have you got one specific thing you want to say, Bashir? Yes, I think that the chances given to American high school education to be more provided and to be improved. And I think many of the materials and educators are provided for this purpose. The materials are and provided, the educators are, are provided, provided for this purpose of developing the American high school education. Therefore, in spite of your criticisms, you say there's no reason why the education here can't be good because the ingredients are there. Yes. Thank you for saying that. What about you, Anne? What have impressed me most with American high schools, I think, is uh, the absolutely wonderful educational materials that your schools offer the students. Final word from you, Sangmi? Well, I should like to tell you that the, uh, uh, I have found lots of American students who are complaining of their own educational system, I said, as I said before, and they want to study more difficult subjects. And I know that they don't want to be inferior to the other students in other countries. I earnestly suggest that the American educators should consider of these uh, intelligent students in America. Thank you, Sangri and John and Anne and Bashir. I'm sorry, we'll leave you now until this same time next week.